Hello, my name is Rachel Beck. I am the Senior Manager of Special Projects for Union Pacific Railroad. I have been with Union Pacific going on seven years now and have held several different roles uh, within the engineering department during that time, uh, including manager of track maintenance, senior manager of tie assessment, senior manager of road bed assessment. Uh, and I'm also the current chair of the composite tie subcommittee within ARIMA committee 30. And this presentation today is just a little bit of a dive into how Union Pacific is contributing to shaping the composite tie industry within the US today. Union Pacific has a comparatively long history with composite ties, but really in the last three years or so, we've taken an even greater vested interest in developing in-house installation and, and testing strategies, which is what I plan on uh, presenting here today. Now, all of the steps that we are taking currently really stem from us continuously asking the question of you know, what makes a good composite tie. And the first areas we chose to focus on were thermal loading and how thermal loading or thermal differentials that a tie experiences relate to its fatigue characteristics. And we chose to investigate this through both in-track testing as well as controlled lab testing. So we'll start with our field testing. While we have installations of composite ties um, across our railroad, uh, we have three sites that I really consider to be our test sites. The first being the mega site on our South Morrill sub, which is home to several different composite tie types that were all installed out of face in panels. And then we have two sites where we have instrumented ties that are collecting data 24 sevens. So the ties at these two locations are strain gauged um, and track strain, as well as temperature effects through thermal couples that are applied to the top and bottom of the tie. And each site, both the Chester sub and the Omaha sub has a weather station that tracks um, constant environmental conditions. And all of this data that is collected tells us what strains and stresses a composite tie might experience in an average track environment. And the goal of this data collection was always to help drive specifications for testing ties in our lab setting and creating a fatigue test that would be able to mimic what these composite ties are, are actually experiencing in track. But in order to have a truly controlled installation, we needed to remove um, any possibility of premature failures that would not be a result of the tie's ability to perform in track. So from many of our previous installations, we've observed that a large number of ties fail during install due to either handling or spiking um, or other installation forces. So for the two instrumented installations, we tracked and followed a very controlled and specific set of best practices. That first best practice we followed was that all ties were unloaded in bundles and placed at the site, as opposed to being dropped um, out of a car. Um, and then once they had been placed in bundles, they were then broken out and individually placed across the site um, to reduce the amount of brake force that they might um, experience. Next, every crib was cleared by a scarifier uh, to reduce any friction and force that the tie might undergo during insertion. We then took the time to talk to all of our trip operators about the importance of taking care when installing these composite ties and to not cause them to have any excessive bending force, not using them to, to crib out the spot or anything like that, that could result in any kind of um, 
premature center breaking. All of the ties at this installation were also pre-drilled. We did um, select a few at our Chester site to not pre-drill, and we have been tracking uh, their performance as well. Um, but the majority of all ties were pre-drilled per the manufacturer's specifications in order to reduce um, any premature spike hole cracking or any material displacement underneath the tie plate that might create um, a point load or something like that on the tie. And the final best practice that we followed was the utilization of a specific spike pattern where no two spikes were drilled on the same plane. And we did this in order to reduce um, or minimize the amount of blowouts that we might experience prematurely. And following all of these best practices allowed us to be really confident in the data that is being collected out there. And we've been able to use it to help develop our current lab testing model. And our goal, like I said before, with this model was to develop a severe uh, service load test that would use multiple real world inputs, including temperature, deflection, stress and strain. Um, and all of these inputs would have the ability to mimic um, any type of track scenario. Uh, in the case of the tests we're currently utilizing, it mimics what we would consider kind of a worst case um, in track scenario. So in partnership with ESI, uh, UP has built this temperature controlled chamber that you see before you. And this chamber has the ability to create a significant temperature differential um, within a composite tie while still cycle loading it using an MTS machine. And as designed right now, the temperature chamber mimics extreme conditions. Um, and it also center binds the tie. Uh, it monitor, monitors bending strain, um, the tie temperature on both the top and the bottom. Um, it measures end deflection, rail seat deflection, and rail seat load as well. So we start by loading the tie at ambient temperature uh, with zero load displacement. Uh, then we load the tie until that end deflection is around an inch and a half and record those measurements. Then the tie is returned to the zero displacement by the MTS machine. Um, the tie is chilled in the temperature chamber, enclosed in there um, for about four hours. Then those heat lamps at the top of the tie are turned on and the tie soaks in there for an additional approximately 18 hours to create that temperature differential and the temperatures we aim to achieve are those that reflect in our in-track data. Uh, once we do that, new measurements are recorded. Uh, then the ties loaded to the previous rail seat deflection that resulted in that inch and a half end displacement. Measurements are recorded. Then that tie is cycled um, from you know initial displacement up to max displacement while it's undergoing that temperature differential um, for you know up to five million cycles or until the tie fails. So currently with our lab test we have we have been ac be been able to accurately mimic um, what we consider to be field failures within our lab. Um, Ties, like I said, are being cycled at an inch and a half of deflection. That could be reduced to an inch and a quarter to an inch. Um, that inch and a half is sort of a maximum deflection that we might expect to see. And it does, um, it does tend to unfairly bias against stiff ties. And we are working to remedy that um, because stiff ties not necessarily a bad thing. Um, we're able to to keep a pretty significant temperature differential. Um, we've had failures anywhere from 3,000 cycles up to 
uh, three million cycles. So a lot of different um, experiences we've seen within the composite ties that we've tested. Um, we can switch to either a strain-based or a load-based test from here. Um, and, and we do run into challenges with the current strain gauges that we use. Um, but despite those challenges, we are pretty confident in, in the types of results that we've been able to achieve given our current test. So that brings us back to what makes a good composite tie. So we've talked about thermal loading and its relation to fatigue characteristics, how we are testing that both in the field as well as in a simulation. Um, so the second area of focus um, we have is looking into what uh, material or physical properties are important in a composite tie. Uh, some specific characteristics we look at are a tie's modulus of elasticity, modulus of rupture, its thermal conductivity, um, its thermal expansion, um, whether what spike pullout strength it has, as well as the amount of temperature um, induced gauge widening um, that, that a tie might see in track in you know, a 24 hour period. So in speaking about MOE and MOR, here's our current uh, Ben testing results of all the ties that we have been currently testing in track. And as you can see, um, we, we, this, this graph is representative of both successful and, and less successful composite ties. And we really feel that it's indicative of the existence of some sort of best fit line um, that would show a relationship between MOE and MOR versus a singular um, good MOR number and a good MOE number. We feel like um, a lot of times if, if you've got that stiffer, higher MOE tie, as long as your MOR is within a certain range, it could be successful and vice versa if you have a lower MOE. Um, and so uh, we're really looking at how to narrow down what that relationship might be. More to come on that. Um, alternatively, we have also done some digging into the specific material properties that might make a composite tie successful. So we took six different composite ties and did an in-depth material properties test on them in the hope to better sort of characterize their material. So first we did CT scanning and we were able to have a, to from that have a visual representation of, you know, fiber size, uh, fiber fraction, um, as well as more visibility into a tie's solid or void percentage or orientations. We then performed a TGA analysis and then an EDS test on the residue from the TGA analysis in order to get a better qualitative analysis of the material that remained after heating. Uh, we also tested the thermal conductivity of each sample. Um, and the average of all the ties um, that we tested was in the three, three tenths range. So um, fairly high conductivity, much higher than, than wood. Um, and we had some, some ties uh, greater than, than that 0.3, but nothing, nothing lower than the 0.3 range. And from all of these material analyses, um, we were able to kind of group our composite samples into three main categories. So one is ties that were primarily polyethylene with a chopped fiber and a foaming agent. Um, two ties with um, that were very similar to one but had more inorganic fillers. Um, and then three ties that were a mixture of partially melted infused plastics and, and other materials that were not as identifiable. 
but you know, after all of that, what does that tell us about how a composite tie will actually perform in track? Well, we still don't really know. <laughs> but what we do know is that there should be significant considerations made when it comes to a tie's strength, a tie's flexibility, and its thermal conductivity. We feel like those are the three main considerations that at this point are measurable, definable, and adjustable. Um, other considerations are that are important, like um, quality control, uh, we feel like we have already have the ability to solve those um, with good processes. And then a uh, consideration like thermal expansion um, is really dictated by the material selection and the base polymer that's used. Um, so those, those instances are really controlled by the supplier and the market, whereas strength, flexibility, thermal conductivity are something measurable and testable that we feel like as an industry, we can come to a determination of what's, what would make a tie successful and kind of go from there. So where does UP want to take it from here? So we've got our ongoing field tests, ongoing lab testing um, that our hope we hope are allowing us to help define kind of the necessary next steps as an industry that we need to to make um, compositize successful. Um, but specifically in 2021, uh, Union Pacific will be increasing its installation of composite ties following our detailed best practices procedures and um, continuing to do um, pointed monitoring of these ties in track. Um, we will also be looking to expand our usage of composites into yards and eventually um, switch ties, um, trying to look at you know, what do those specifications look like? How do they differ from a current mainline cross tie? Um, and in 2022, we would like to have an installation of yard or switch ties. Um, and, and isolate those performances and, and, and evaluate um, the feasibility of utilizing composite ties in those scenarios. Um, we're going to continue to refine our surfacing model specifically for us to help mitigate continued center binding issues um, and strains that uh, our composite ties that are already installed are undergoing. Um, and eventually, uh, we'll look at assessing whether composites with alternative reinforcements like steel are an option and what those would look like. So that's all I have, but I hope there was a bit of interest in what was presented here today. Um, and UP really is dedicated um, to finding ways to make composite ties successful. Um, and we will continue to, to strive for that. And of course, if there are any questions about what was presented here today, please feel free to reach out to me. And I thank you guys for your attention.